going to continue our series through the Holy Spirit. Um, here's what I would, I, I want you to catch this because this is what I want you to walk away with. When the Holy Spirit moves, things happen. When the Holy Spirit moves, things happen. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to look to the person on your left. I want you Because you're going to have time to tell everybody here in just a little bit. I want you to look to the person on your left, and I want you to just tell them, when the Holy Spirit moves, things happen. Go ahead. Yeah. Good. And you sound like you're not convinced. But anyway, take your Bibles. Go over to Genesis chapter 1. I want you to see the first, the first time in Scripture we come across the Holy Spirit moving. I'm going to read to you verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, we, we've got that down. Now, the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And look at this. And the Spirit of God was what? The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. This word, so, so this word hovering is, is a neat word. It means to move with purpose, to act with purpose. And, and he, this is a, a wonderful section, two verses of where you and I get a glimpse of God the Father, God the Son, and certainly God the Spirit as they are working in concert with each other. Okay, I, I mean, working together. Now, you may go, no, wait a second. It says in the beginning God created, so we got God the Father there, and it says the Spirit, but where's the Son in all this? Well, that's where you have to go to John 1, or you have to go to Colossians uh, chapter 1, verse, verse 15 to 20. You have to go to one of those two areas, and you'll see where it says that everything, speaking of Jesus, everything was created by Him and for Him, and without Him, not anything was made. So you have, you have what we call the Trinity, and you'll never see that word in the Bible. The word Trinity doesn't exist in the Bible. It's, it's a word that describes the oneness of three, and it's really difficult to get our heads around that. But just for now, this is what I want you to see. In the beginning, when God is getting ready to speak everything into existence, the Holy Spirit is active. He's hovering. He's just hovering, and he's moving with purpose. And all of a sudden, God speaks, and when God speaks, the Spirit acts, and things happen. God says, let there be light. Boom, light. Literally, it says, light be, light was. That quick. Light be, light was. Now, listen, I don't know where you come down on, the, on creation. I know among, among Christians, there's all kinds of debate about, is, is it a six-day literal creation? Is it six million years? Is, it, is there a gap in time between each day? All kinds of stuff, all kinds of things. Is it a young earth, an old earth? And all, you know, I, don't get, I don't get hung up on that. I just get hung up on this. God did it. He did it. His Holy Spirit energized it. And you know what? The Holy Spirit and God in, in the Scripture didn't see fit to explain to us exactly how He did it. He just says, just believe me. Just believe me, I did it. So here God speaks, the Holy Spirit Acts, there's light, there's sky, let there be land and sea, and, and you know, let the sea only come so far, uh, let, let all of that happen, let there be fish, let there be birds, let there be animals, let there be vegetation, and every time God's speaking, let there be the Holy Spirit's moving, it's like the Holy Spirit, every time that He moves, things happen, every time, turn to the person on your right, tell them. Every time the Holy Spirit moves, things happen. Every time in creation. And see, we, as a church and as Christians, we don't have a big issue too much with this. The majority, the vast majority of Christians believe that God energized creation. God created. He spoke it into existence, but how it came to exist are, is where the debate sits, but that's neither here nor there in my mind. God did it. 
And we go, yes, I believe God did that. I believe that the, the universe and all of creation points to his handiwork. I get that. Rick Clark, if you just want to know, well, where, where, do you, where do you come down on this? Well, listen, I still can't get past this. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. I have a very simple faith. And I'm able to, I, I have such a simple faith that if God said he created it in six days, and I'm going, you did it in six days. Okay, that's where I am. Uh, you may not be there. We're still brothers in Christ, sisters in Christ. That's cool. Okay, we go on. Second thing, the Holy Spirit in, not in creation, but now in recreation. And, and I want you to look at uh, John chapter 3. John chapter 3. You'll have to give me a moment just to work through my Bible because I'm going a few places today. Come here, John. I begin at verse 3. Jesus replied, speaking to Nicodemus, Very truly I tell you that no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Well, how can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time in their mother's womb. Aren't you glad? I know your mom is. Uh, Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you that no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are, check this out, born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying that you must be born again. So when Jesus is saying you have to be born again, all of us have been born of water. All of us, all of us have been born of water. Your mother's water breaks, boom, out you come. Okay, we've all been born of water. We've been born once. When Jesus is saying you have to be born again, now instead of being just born of water, now we need to be born of the Spirit, born from above. That's why it's called being born again or called the second birth because the Spirit then gives birth to our dead spirits who have been dead in sin. That's the recreation. And it's the Holy Spirit that does that. It's the Holy Spirit that brings life to us, allows us to be born again. Because when the Holy Spirit moves Things happen. He creates. He recreates. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And then I want you to uh, look over in, um, we'll go over to Romans chapter 8 because we're going to look at the Holy Spirit in the resurrection of Jesus. I, I just want you to, I'm just doing a kind of a quick sweep of some things so I can get to where I want to be. In Romans 8, verse 11, look at this. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give to your mortal bodies, or will give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. And if you look there at verse 11, you see the one who raised Jesus from the dead was none other than who? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit moves into that tomb, into the lifeless body of Jesus, and raises Jesus from the dead. As a matter of fact, earlier in the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 4, here's, here's what Paul writes in the fourth verse of chapter 1. Who through the spirit of holiness, talking about Jesus, who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power. That word power is a gigantic word. By his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So Paul's going to say in Romans 8 and then in Romans 1 that the Spirit is who brought Jesus back from the dead and he does it in power. The word power is an interesting word. The word power is in the Greek is the word dunamis, D-U-N-A-M-I-S, dunamis. And it means dynamite. It's where we get our, our word for dynamite. It is, it is a powerful move of the Holy Spirit because when he moves, things happen and, and, and what we think are impossible things happen. 
Here's, here's a guy who's dead in the tomb and been there for three days. And the Spirit of God moves in and he brings life back into the lifeless body of Jesus and brings him back to life, never to die again. Because when the Holy Spirit moves, things are going to happen. Now, here's, here's what I find interesting. Of the things we just talked about, creation, being born again, and the resurrection of Jesus, the vast majority of Christians have no problem with that. The vast majority of Christians will will nod their head in agreement. Yes, I believe in those things. I believe God spoke everything into existence. I believe that when when I called out to, to God to save me from my sins, that the that the death of Jesus was sufficient to pay for my sins and the Holy Spirit then came and entered into me and brought this dead soul to life. And I believe that when Jesus died on the cross, he was physically dead, no heartbeat, nothing going on, buried in the tomb, and three days later came out because the Holy Spirit energized him. I believe that, and the vast majority of Christians do. But it's interesting to me that when it comes to the Christmas season and it comes to the Christmas story, that when we get to this idea of a virgin birth, that, that all of a sudden a, a larger number of Christians begin to have problems with the idea that Jesus would be born of a virgin. They, they, they struggle with bring, bringing their faith to, to just be brought around that because it just seems too out there and for a variety of other reasons. And so what I want us to do today is I want us to look at, at the account of, of Mary and um, Mary encountering the angel Gabriel and being told that she is going to be having a baby. And this is certainly going to be a difficult time for her, but it's going to be the most joyous time as well. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to go into Matthew chapter 1. We'll start there and then we'll do, we'll go into Luke chapter 1. I'm going to start reading at verse 18. We'll read to verse 25 in Matthew 1. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, now it's really important that you you circle and highlight that phrase, before they came together, because here's what you're going to come across among those who really uh, trash the idea of a virgin birth. They believe that there was a virgin birth, but not in the sense of someone who, uh, of a woman who hadn't been with a man. Rather, they believe that the word virgin simply meant young woman. And in some cases, they're right. In some cases, they can make a case for that position that, look, virgin simply meant she was somewhere around 14, 15 years old. Just a young girl is what it meant. But there are... And, and, and they can use certain words in the text to, to describe that and define that. But what they overlook are the other words in the text that define this as a, define Mary as a person who had never been with a man. Okay? And, and it's important that we don't overlook that fact. So Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through who? The Holy Spirit. There he is again. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from who? It's from the Holy Spirit. She'll give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. 
All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. Now, you need to circle that part. And he gave him the name Jesus. Now, if you just flip over a couple books and go over to Luke 1, we'll pick this up in verse 26. And if you want to see this writing lived out, acted out, just go to the Christmas cave. In the sixth month of of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words, which I would be too, and you would be too, and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you're to call him Jesus, and he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Verse 34. And you need to circle verse 34. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? She got it. She understood. She's a young girl, to be sure. But at the same time, she knew, okay, hey, whoa. How's this going to happen? How am I, a young girl who is a virgin, I'm a virgin, how can I give birth? She's in her own words saying, I haven't been with anybody. How can I do that? And the angel answers, just without detail, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And, and so I, wanted, I want you to see, you remember over in Genesis 1 where the Spirit was hovering, moving with purpose? You have, you have that same idea here in the word overshadow. You have the Holy Spirit, the angel telling Mary, the Holy Spirit is going to overshadow you. He's doing something with purpose so that that the one in you is not going to be from the seed of a man, but this is going to be the Holy Spirit just simply placing a seed in you, and this one is going to really be the Son of God. That's Dad. And so, so that, that response then satisfies Mary to the point that she in simple faith humbles herself and says, then, then Lord, do what you're going to do. I'm your servant. Use me. Yeah. Why do we struggle with this so much? Because I, I've got to tell you this. This virgin birth is a thing of the fist. Do you remember the fist? That Jesus is the virgin-born Son of God in the flesh. That when He died, He died for our sins. He rose again from the dead. He is the only way to heaven. And he is coming back one day. Those things make up the truth of the Christian faith. And if you take away any one of those things, then you don't have a complete Christian faith. It's important that we have this. Why is the virgin birth then so important for us? 
Why is it so important? Maybe I should say the virgin conception. I don't know, but, but you know what I'm saying. Is it really necessary? It's necessary on two counts. Number one, so that Jesus could literally be the Son of God. Because if Mary just kind of slipped off with some dude and then came out of the woodwork and said, God did it. This is a God thing. Okay, it's not, not me. I wasn't with if If there's a human father, then the baby that's to be born is no different than you or me. The baby to be born is going to be tainted with sin because they will receive the sin nature that was passed down through Adam, through the dude. Okay, now, because God's the father, then this one that's to be born of woman, but God being the father... Jesus comes on the scene, and he is now fully God in the flesh. He is not just the son of Mary, but he is the son of God in the flesh. And as such, then secondly, the reason why the the virgin birth is necessary is so that Jesus could be the perfect sacrifice. Because if Jesus were born just of another guy and Mary, then and he goes to the cross, he's just another guy on the cross. Because he carries that sin nature just like you and I carry that sin nature. But because he's the Son of God, here's what the Scripture is going to tell you in the, in the book of Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we, this is talking about Jesus, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not, but he didn't sin. Jesus was able to face temptation as a man But yet, as God, not give in to temptation. And since he didn't give in to temptation, then he was able to lay his life down on the cross as a perfect sacrifice that would be accepted by God so that you and so that that I can put my faith and my confidence in his work on the cross, his death, his resurrection and be made in a right relationship with the Father once again. So Jesus has to be born of a virgin in order for those things to happen. It can't come any other way. And so, so uh, this, was, this is kind of interesting. Here's, here's the most memorized passage of Scripture in the Bible, John 3.16. And in John 3.16, Jesus is speaking... Uh, what, what he already knows when, when he says, for God so loved the world, God the Father so loved the world, that he gave who? Okay, now this is important. His only, and the word begotten is an important word, his only begotten son. This is the only son he ever had, Jesus. And the reason why he's calling Jesus, his only son, is because it all goes back to when the, when the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary and the seed was placed in Mary from God through the Holy Spirit. Because when he moves, things happen. And when he moves and things happen, maybe we can't intellectually always explain how, but we can intellectually understand why. Why it was so important that we celebrate Christmas, we celebrate the birth of Jesus, and we celebrate the fact that Mary was was a virgin when she gave birth to Jesus. Jesus, God's salvation. Now, which then brings up this question. Well, wait, wait one second. Aren't we all sons and daughters of God? 
I mean, Jesus is a son. Aren't we all sons and daughters of God? The answer to that is yes and no. Yes, we are. Yes, we are sons and daughters of God. But the difference between Jesus and us is this. Jesus is literally the Son of God because God is His Father through the Holy Spirit. Because when the Holy Spirit moved, things happened. Mary got pregnant, and the, the seed that was placed in her was from God, not from a man. Are you with me? But, but the difference between Jesus and, and you and me is that we are adopted into the family. Jesus is the son. We're the adopted kids. And we're adopted, all of us adopted the same way. And that is through the working and through the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and I want you to see this in Romans chapter 8. And, and I'm just going to read verses 15 and 16. Romans 8. The spirit that you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. We're his children. But we're his children through adoption. So when we, we gather this Christmas season, as you're about doing all the things that you're going to be doing, preparing for the Christmas season, don't overlook the fact that God gave us the greatest gift ever in sending His Son, Jesus, to us. He came to live among us as God's Son, God fully in the flesh. He came to show us not, not just the way to God. He came to be the way to God. And so you and I who are separated from God because of our sin, you and I are separated from Him, but God has given us Jesus, and because He was faithful, He gave His life on the cross. He rose again from the dead so that you and I can have forgiveness of sin and be in a right relationship with Him and carry about in our very lives the Spirit of God because this is now where He lives. A lot rides on the virgin birth. Don't, don't set it aside. It's a big deal. God gave you a gift. and My prayer is that through, throughout the season then, that somehow you will be able to have the opportunity to encounter other people who have yet to unwrap the gift. And maybe God would actually use you to speak the love of God into someone else's life and use you to draw them into a saving relationship with the Father. That would be a wonderful thing. Next week, as we, we keep working on the Holy Spirit, we're going, to be, we're going to be jumping into prophecy. We're going to be looking at God moving in the lives of sinful people and actually speaking through them to accomplish the things that, that were going to be accomplished through the birth of Jesus Christ. We're going to be digging into that next week. That's where I'm planning on going. So for now, I, I would like to have a word of prayer with you, and then we're going to get out of here and beat the streets, and we're just going to go tell the world about Jesus Christ. All right, let's bow our heads together. Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for the time when we could worship you uh, in song, that we could take communion together as a family. I thank you for your word, and I, I, I thank you, Father, for the hard things of your word, the times where... We, we don't fully understand or comprehend with our minds. And it's in those times, Father, I pray you will bolster our faith. And Father, I thank you that you gave us Jesus, that through your Holy Spirit, 
you overshadowed Mary and you brought your son into this world. And I thank you more that as he grew up, he grew up as a perfect person, a perfect sacrifice for us. And may we walk out of here today determined to live our lives representing Jesus. And may the Holy Spirit continue to work in us. I pray throughout this week that you will open doors of opportunity for us to be able to share your love with someone this week. We give you praise and honor and glory. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen. Christmas is here, bringing good cheer to young and old, meek and bold. Ding dong, ding dong, that is the song. With joyful ring, all carol here. One seems to hear words of good cheer from.